Hi, thank you for joining us for Butterflies, Beads, Birds, and More, Establishing a Pollinator Garden. This is a presentation brought to you by Tarrant Regional Water District, and uh, we're going to be talking about establishing a pollinator garden. Before I start our presentation about establishing a pollinator garden, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Tarrant Regional Water District. TRWD supports this presentation and maintains four area lakes and all of the pipelines that are needed to provide surface water to local water treatment plants, which then treat that water to drinking water standards and provide it to our communities. TRWD works with many cities within Tarrant County, such as Arlington, Fort Worth, and Mansfield, and other smaller cities to provide um, educational programming just like this one and information about water conservation. Conservation is an important water supply strategy to help meet the needs of a growing population, and that's why TRWD promotes things like this. Um, we support programs that help save water through um, outdoor watering and gardening education. So you can go to SaveTarrantWater.com and sign up for some of our programs that we have to help people do that. You can sign up, um, if you're a Tarrant County resident, you can sign up for a free sprinkler evaluation where a licensed irrigator will come to your house free of charge, take a look at your sprinkler system and let you know if there's any maintenance that needs to be done or if there's any ways that you can reduce water waste. You can also at SaveTarrantWater.com sign up for free weekly watering advice that's custom to your location. And so every Monday you'll get a, either a text message or an email telling you how much you should water your lawn according to the weather. SaveTarrantWater.com. There's also a calendar of events and classes that are happening similar to this one in the future. Um, and then you can also take a look at some of our other water saving um, tips and videos. There are um, gardening videos. There are also DIY sprinkler videos, things of that nature. And also, Tarrant Regional Water District also partners with other organizations such as Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service and the Tarrant County Master Gardeners um, to provide some of this educational programming like you're seeing today. Okay, now that I've talked a little bit about TRWD and their support for this program, I'm going to go ahead and dive into the presentation. So I'm going to talk to you today about uh, establishing a pollinator garden. So well, I'm going to start out with just talking about what a pollinator garden is. So a pollinator garden is a garden that is created to attract pollinators. And the reason why it uh, attracts pollinators is because it provides habitat for those pollinators. So food, water, housing, and nursery. So a place um, for those pollinators to lay their eggs and for those children to, to grow up. So you might be wondering what pollinator gardens have to do with water conservation. And so, like I said, water conservation is an important water supply strategy for TRWD um, to continue to maintain our supplies within the future. And so we know that the outdoor watering use um, accounts for a lot of our water consumption, particularly during the summertime. And then it also accounts for a lot of water waste. So creating smart and efficient landscaping um, can reduce that outdoor water consumption and that outdoor water waste and pollinator gardens are, are a way to do that. So generally, um, pollinator gardens are made of low water use native plants. Um, and also, um, a lot of times people will replace turf um, with a pollinator garden that is generally lower water use than a conventional landscape or the turf that was there before. And I know this presentation is called um, Butterflies, Bees, Birds, and More, but there's tons of different types of pollinators. Um, beetles, flies, bugs, of course, moths are the other part of butterflies. Um, and then things like bats. You can also, with your pollinator garden, attract a lot of other different types of wildlife if you'd like. So today I'm going to walk you through the steps of establishing a pollinator garden. Um, for maximum impact to water conservation, replacement of a portion of turf with a pollinator garden is really optimal. So that's the point of view that I'm going to be going from <clears throat> when um, describing these steps. But it's also something that can be done from an existing bed 
Um, along the way, you'll be seeing photos of each step, and those photos are from my garden um, and a colleague of mine's gardens, where we both um, replaced some turf and uh, wanted to walk everyone through the process of that. So starting with the first step, when thinking about your ideas that you have for a pollinator garden and the things that you want, it's really best to start from big and then go to small. So first you want to think about things like the location and the overall look, and size and shape that you're looking for, your overall design. Then you'll look smaller and start thinking about what type of plant choice you want, what type of placement that you want for those plants and things like that. So first off, you really need to think about some of the more practical things like how much sun does the does the spot get? Pollinators need um, at least part sun, mainly full sun. These plants they like that like to flower and that um, support the pollinators also generally like full sun. It's also good to look at um, your water source and your soil moisture levels. So see if it's an area that you know stays pretty dry or it stays pretty wet. Again. Low water use native plants are generally what are used for pollinator gardens, so you probably want to pick an area that is um, that does dry out. And again, if it's a full sun area, that probably will be an area that does dry out. You want to think about making sure that your pollinator garden is combined at least, you know, 100 or so square feet. In general, that's how big it needs to be to um, attract a good amount of pollinators and for it to be lucrative enough, lucrative enough for pollinators to come and visit. Another thing you want to think about is definitely your water source. How are you going to water this? If you are replacing a, a piece of your turf, um, is that, do you already have an irrigation system? Is that all on one zone? Are you going to be able to di differentiate those heads? Those are all things that you need to think about. And then after all of that, and you've thought about kind of like, you know, the placement of your garden and how you want it to look and everything, then you can start, start thinking about the pollinators what you want to attract and what type of plants you want to look for to attract those type of pollinators. So next you want to start thinking about your design and your plant layout. Of course this is a pollinator garden so first and foremost we want to think about those pollinators. So it's really important to clump smaller plants together. Odd numbers generally look good um, just in terms of aesthetics but clumping those smaller plants together again makes it lucrative enough for that pollinator to come visit that clump because there's a lot of the same type of flower that they might want to get nectar from. You also want to make sure to provide some type of bare ground soil or mulch or something like that. A lot of these pollinators are uh, solitary and they will um, create holes in bare ground and lay their eggs inside there to overwinter and so you want to make sure you provide some of that bare ground for them. You also want to make sure that there's a water source and that could be you know, it doesn't have to be standing water, uh, particularly with butterflies, they really like shallow water. Um, so it could just be a small dish with some rocks in it and a little bit of water, but um, these pollinators all do still need a water source. And if, if your end goal for your pollinator garden is to get it certified by uh, one of the various pollinator certification services like the National Wildlife Federation um, or Texas Parks and Wildlife, it's also going to need a water source to qualify for that. It's also important to leave a little bit of dead vegetation for as long as you possibly can. A lot of these pollinators, again, they overwinter or lay their eggs in dead vegetation. And so you wanna to try to keep as much of that dead vegetation as possible. Um, and then think about housing, right? Uh, if you wanna attract birds, maybe think about bird houses. There are also bee houses that you can buy uh, or make yourself. You can think about things like bat houses or things like that. So um, depending on what you want to attract, you wanna make sure that you have food for them and that you have some type of house for them. And then just looking at your basic design, you know, aesthetics, of course you want to put your taller plants in the back and in the middle and your short, shorter plant, plants in the front so that you can see everything. You might want to start thinking about a theme, like is there certain colors that you want, certain textures, certain types of flowers? Um, is it something that you want to be symmetrical or, you know, is it a type of design that um, you don't want to have symmetry? And then, uh, of course, if you don't want to make your own design, you can always look at a pre-made design. There are plenty of awesome designs on the internet. Um, and a lot of times, you know, even if they don't have the exact plants in them that you want, you can kind of replicate the design or replicate the look of the plants within the design.
So this is just some examples of some different types of um, gardening designs that you can draw inspiration from for a pollinator garden. The two on the top is a um, what I would call like a traditional cottage style um, garden, and those are really good for pollinator gardens because it does have those larger clumps of you know colorful plants there. Um, all together and it makes it really easy for the pollinators to come and get all the resources that they want. Um, but if you look at the bottom left hand corner, you know, that's something that is um, a more traditional type of landscaping. Now in that photo in the front there, it shows some marigolds and those are not the best pollinator plants definitely, but if you replace those plants um, with something that looked exactly the same but was um, a native pollinator plant, then you could have the exact same type of uh, more traditional design just replacing those plants with the plants that the pollinators love. And then the bottom right hand corner there, that's kind of more like a wildflower meadow. And so that's something that you can do. It looks a little bit messier um, and it takes maybe possibly a little bit more time to grow because a lot of times you will grow a wildflower flower meadow from seed, but it's also way less maintenance, um, way less water use. A lot of times people will put this in the strip um, you know, near their driveway or in between the sidewalk and the street, those areas that get a lot of traffic and get a lot of um, rough treatment and not much water or anything like that in these wildflower meadows will definitely um, withstand all of that and also attract tons of pollinators. So when looking at the design layout, there's a lot of different things you can do. If you've already got the plants, um, that's something that can happen, you know, that's kind of how I made my garden. I was moving from one house to another one. I had pulled some plants out, so I already had the plants, so I needed to find places for those existing plants. There's also the possibility where you don't know what plants you want yet, and you just want to get your general design laid out, and then you want to find some plants that fit into those categories, and that's fine too. And so you can lay it out in real life if you already have the plants there. Um, you can do just a quick drawing. You can also look and um, do kind of a more formal. I did this one, the one with the circles here. You can see I did that on PowerPoint where I just made different circles uh, that were uh, the sizes of the spacing that they needed to be and the different colors and I arranged them to kind of look in a way that I wanted. And when you're creating a design, you just need to make sure that you know, you know, the height of those plants and um, the width of those plants at maturity and how much space that they're actually gonna need. Next, after you've got your design and everything, you're gonna go ahead and start choosing your plants. And so, like I said, number one, your plants are gonna be um, native or adapted, generally low water use plants. And for those pollinators, the pollinators that are here, um, with the exception of honeybees, are all generally native pollinators. And so they have evolved to be um, supported by these plants. Uh, these native plants and so those are the plants that you want to put in your garden in order to attract those native pollinators. Um, you want to definitely think about water use. Most of the plants are going to be like I said low water use but there are natives that are medium water use or high water use and so you just want to keep that in mind. Are you mixing them together? Do you have one you know one section maybe that has some higher water use plants and then the lower water use ones are in another section so that you can make sure that you can water them appropriately and things like that. Um, with the native plants, a lot of times it is kind of possible um, to mix some of the different ones, the different water uses, depending um, if you have some same medium water use native plants, which are still lower water use compared to your traditional ornamental plants that are non-native, um, you can mix them with some of the lower water use native plants. And a lot of times with those low water use natives, um, watering them more will simply produce more growth and more blooms. You also want to make sure that you're choosing perennials. Those are the plants that come back year after year and you don't have to replant them and they will continue to get bigger and bigger year after year and provide more and more flowers for your uh, pollinators. In terms of looking at all the different plants that you choose, you want to make sure that you have um, enough diversity to where you have plants blooming year round. So if you want pollinators in your garden year round, you need to make sure that you're providing them food year round. One of the really important things is to have at least one type of species that is um, really early flowering. So these pollinators are just coming out of their hibernation and they need a jump start and they need some of that nectar or that pollen. And so you wanna make sure that you have something that is gonna bloom really early in the season to provide that for them. And then throughout the spring, summer and fall, those main blooming seasons, you wanna make sure that you have at least two to three different types of plants blooming at all periods of time.
looking at the variety of plant types, you want to also make sure that's um, some high diversity. So you want to have um, maybe some grasses, some flowers, some bushes. Um, a lot of uh, the bushes, the woody things, a lot of those provide um, seeds and berries for birds. And so those are great to have. A lot of the grasses, although um, pollinators might not visit the actual flowers and pollinate the flowers themselves, they use that vegetation um, either as a larval host to eat um, or they, like I said, overwinter in that vegetation and use it as housing. So um, having more than just flowers is, is definitely important to support these pollinators. It's also just important to have high diversity. Uh, if you want a variety of um, different types of pollinators, you need to have a variety of different types of uh, flower shapes and different plant, plant families that are going to support those different pollinators. And then you just really want to think about what type of pollinators you want to attract. You want to make sure that like, if you want to attract a specific butterfly or a specific bird or whatever it is, you need to make sure that you're planting those plants um, that provide food and housing for both the um, adults and the babies of whatever that is. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what that is. If you're trying to attract butterflies, you want flowers that are bright colors, red and purple, things like that. Um, the flower shapes are tubes with spurs, things with wide landing pads. So it's something that the, you know, the butterfly can come and light on. They do like nectar guides. So nectar guides are sometimes invisible to the human eye, sometimes not. And those are little designs within the flower that kind of um, guide the eye to the middle of the flower or guide the pollinator's eye um, to where the, the nectar is or where the pollen is. For butterflies, it's also important to provide some rotting fruit. So there's a whole nother suite of butterflies that do not eat nectar. They don't eat pollen. They don't visit flowers. Um, they visit rotting fruit and they eat that rotting fruit. I know um, one really common one in this area is called the question mark butterfly. And if you have just solely a, um, a flower garden, you will likely not see that question mark butterfly. You need rotting fruit out there. And so some great plants for that, um, Greg's mist flower or blue mist flower, those are absolutely wonderful for the butterflies. If you have a patch of that, you will have hundreds of butterflies at some um, periods of time. Mealy blue sage is also great for butterflies. Um, and button bush. Button bush is a high water use plant. So if you have a more wet uh, soil area, um, that's something that's good for the button bush. And they also attract tons of butterflies and lots of the really large, awesome butterflies. Also, when you're thinking about butterflies, you want to think about the caterpillars too, right? So um, these caterpillars eat host plants. We all, for the most part, know about monarchs and that monarch butterflies, the caterpillars, eat milkweed. And so for north central Texas and for Tarrant County, um, we've got four main milkweeds that grow. There's green milkweed, antelope horns milkweed, zizotes or side cluster milkweed, and butterfly milkweed. And um, those all four will support monarch caterpillars. Um, but there's tons of other different types of um, butterflies that you can attract and tons of different types of plants that they eat. So for instance, um, swallowtails, things like fennel, dill, um, parsley, things in the parsley and carrot family. Um, for the gulf fritillaries, they like the passion vine, which is also an absolutely beautiful plant. So just again, you want to make sure that um, if you want a particular butterfly that you're supporting both the baby um, and the adult of that. When looking to attract bees, you want your flowers to be very bright colors. They like white, yellow, blue. Um, they like things that um, have the, are in the UV spectrum. They also like nectar guides. So um, they want to see, you know, you can see the top right hand um, picture here in the purple flower. There's kind of like some dots in the middle. That's an example of a nectar guide where you can see it's guiding the pollinator down to the middle of the, uh, of the flower. Um, for in terms of flower shapes, is like a, it's shallow with a platform or tubular. Um, they want it, they want sticky scented pollen. So um, there's different types of pollen for different you know types of flowers. And so again, if you if there's a specific bee that you want to attract, say like a bumblebee or a carpenter bee or something like that, or even if you want to support honeybees, you want to make sure that you're getting what you, what they like. Um, and as far as for bees, the uh, plants, mealy blue sage, again, is great for bees. That attracts these large 
um, carpenter bees that you see and also bumblebees a lot. Purple coneflower is great um, for bees. And then black or purple prairie clover is, is also excellent. Um, this picture here is the orange flower you see there. That's actually the butterfly milkweed. Um, and so the butterfly milkweed, great for the monarch caterpillars, but then also you can see that it provides some excellent um, nectar for the bees. Looking at birds, birds like deep colors on, on their flowers. They like things that are red, orange, that type of thing. And they like um, large funnel shaped flowers and cups with strong perches. So you wanna make sure that um, with the exception of hummingbirds, that that's something that um, they can perch on to get you know the fruit or seeds or whatever off. They don't really prefer any type of scent when it comes to flowers, uh, but they do prefer fruits and seeds. So you wanna make sure that um, you're planting some type of plants that not only produce that flower, but then after that flower is done, it produces a fruit, it produces seeds. That is something that the birds wanna eat. Um, in terms of your hummingbirds, they really like, these are the flowers that they like. Um, hummingbird bush, of course, or um, flame acanthus is a, is a big one. Turk's cap is also great for hummingbirds. Lantana they love. And the beautyberry here, um, that's a picture that you can see of a bird eating a beautyberry. And so that produces berries. That is also excellent for, uh, for those songbirds. And now this is just looking at some of those other types of pollinators. And um, for bats and moths, of course, the main thing is that they like those dull, pale colors, things like white and green. Um, and then they like a musty odor. And then, of course, the flowers need to be blooming at night, right? So bats and moths are both night dwelling pollinators, and so we need to make sure that um, we have some type of flowers that are open at night. Uh, one great one, that your ridii is native to here, and it's moonflower. Um, a lot of cacti are also pollinated by bats, and they have night opening flowers. Um, pink evening primrose, blackfoot daisy, yucca, these are all flowers that either bloom exclusively at night or um, are conti you know, continue to be open throughout the day and the night. In terms of beetles, if you're looking to attract some beetles, you know, they really kind of like dull flowers. Um, they like large bowl-like flower shapes. So think of like a magnolia. They like a lot of pollen. Um, and then they like kind of some different scents in terms of, of uh, the scents that they want. But to attract beetles, you might want to plant something like Wedelia or Zexmania, maybe a purple cone flower, Engelmann's daisy, things like that. And then flies, you know, there's kind of two different um, types of things that attract flies. So there are some flowers that mimic uh, rotten flesh and those attract flies. Um, and those flowers would be, you know, these dull, dark colors, brown, purple, and flecked with the clear or white uh, patches. And then they would have some type of, um, yeah, not sweet odor, a putrid odor. But there are also some type of flies that like what you would call regular flowers, right? So these flies are like hover flies or flower flies. And a lot of them, they look really similar to bees, um, but they're actually flies and, and they do the same thing that the bees are doing. So now when you're trying to actually choose those plants and find the plants, like how do you find the native plants, right? How do you know that it's native? So I have created an entire list of, of resources, safetarantwater.com slash pollinator. And you can go um, and it'll give you native plant lists that are appropriate to North Central Texas. There's um, a tool there for finding the natives that are appropriate to your actual location. Um, all you have to do is click on your neighborhood or your house or what your area on the map there and it'll give you an entire list just for that. Um, there's also a tool there where you can look at kind of different landscape designs and how they might um, affect your water use, pollinator support and your um, carbon footprint. And then there's just tons of other resources on there, just all about how um, to find native plants in North Central Texas, what to look for, what type of plants are recommended, all of that. So if you're looking for more specifics about exactly what plants to buy, safetarantwater.com slash pollinator. When you go into the nurseries and you wanna to try to find these plants, um, Sometimes you might go to the nursery and you just have categories in mind, or sometimes you know exactly what type of plant you want, right? And so you just wanna make sure either way that you do it, that you know all the information about a plant before you buy it. You need to know its spacing requirements, how big it gets at maturity. You need to know its, um, its water requirements. 
And um, you need to see how hardy it is. All of these plants, um, if they're native, you know, they should be fine during our winter. So you want to make sure that you're getting stuff that isn't going to die off during our winters. You can, uh, there are some tags that you can look for. One is the Texas Superstar. And so that's something that are plants that are um, adapted to Texas and are good for Texas. And that's something that you can look for. Um, sometimes you will see labels about native plants. You can also do things like visit your local um, native plant society sale or something like that. And you'll know that you're getting uh, native plants from them. Um, I only recommend using seeds if you're doing a wildflower garden. But if you're just doing a you know, more formal perennial pollinator garden, you definitely want to get mature plants. Um, the only time I would recommend maybe getting seeds is if there's a particular native plant that you really want to support a pollinator um, and you can't find it in the nursery or whatever, there's an option to grow it from seed. All right, so first you're gonna, now, now that you've got your plan done, you've got all your plants picked, you know which plants you're gonna use, you know where you're gonna get them from, maybe you've gotten them already. So now you're you're gathering your resources. And so you're gonna need, of course, like all the main stuff, shovels, rake, hand towel, um, a tiller. If you have a gasoline one um, or an electric one, that's awesome, but you can also use a hand one, of course. You're gonna need a water hose to water things in. Um, if you're removing turf, you'll definitely need a flat shovel to remove that turf unless you do have a turf remover. Um, and then you need like a sharpshooter in order to do some digging and tilling. Then you're gonna need compost. You're of course gonna need your plants and then you're gonna need mulch to go on top. If you um, need to know how much mulch to buy, um, you can just go to Google and search like mulch calculator. And um, there's a lot of different sites that you can calculate exactly how much mulch you'll need for your square footage and however thick you want it. Um, and in terms of compost, you know, these, if you are planting native plants, um, they generally are happy to have our native soils, um, which are usually low in nutrients, clay-based, and um, can be harsh for other plants, but our native plants really like it. So you wanna, of course, look at your soil and, and assess it and see if you think you need to add nutrients to it or not. Um, what I do is, I generally, if I'm planting native plants, I just do a general look at the soil and see if it looks like it has some organic matter in it, if it looks like it's deep brown, if it looks like, you know, um, healthy, rich soil. And I'll add a little bit of compost on top and till it in, you know, maybe two to three inches of compost on top and till that into the top six to 12 inches of soil. Um, but in terms of the native plants, I generally do not do a lot of soil amendments um, because they are completely fine with the soil that we provide for them. All right, so just starting um, again, like I said, I'm gonna be throughout this showing you just examples of two different yards where um, me and a colleague have removed turf and created pollinator gardens for ourselves. So you can see the first step, you know, you're gonna prep the site, gonna remove everything, Make sure that you've got things the way that you want them. You've got it all marked out. You've got it measured out. Um, and that that is where you want to dig. You want to make sure that um, you think about beforehand if there's anything buried underground, any wires or anything like that. That's definitely a concern. The first thing you're going to do, if you do have that turf there, is you're going to remove that turf. Um, there's multiple ways that you can do that. If you do have an actual turf remover like a, um, a or access to one, you can certainly use that. That is gonna be the lowest impact <laughs> to um, your time and your effort, but most people don't have that. And so um, manual removal is, is really the best thing. And so that's just taking a flat shovel, going you know right below the, um, the grass roots, maybe like one you know inch into the soil, and just scraping that whole layer of turf off the top. Whether you um, do it manually or solarize it can depend on multiple things. So solarizing the area is where you put some type of um, plastic, either black or clear plastic down on top of it and um, staple it down or um, stake it into the ground. 
and you allow the hot sun to bake it and it essentially kills every all the grass that's underneath there. The only thing about that is, is that um, even after the grass is dead, you still need to remove that grass. So you still might have to do that manual labor of actually removing that top layer of grass. And um, whether you want to do it manually or solarize, it really does depend on what type of grass you have and the amount of time and effort that you want to put into things. If you have St. Augustine, it is going to be pretty easily just removed uh, manually. So you can easily get something just right underneath and remove that top layer of turf. It's not going to leave a lot of runners behind or anything, and it's going to be completely happy to come out. Of course, that's going to take some time and it's going to take some effort and some sweat, but that's really the best for, for St. Augustine. If you have Bermuda grass, it's a little bit more aggressive. And so you might want to solarize it and then remove it to make sure that all those Bermuda runners are dead so that they don't then come back and invade your, your nice new pollinator garden. And again, just another reminder to watch out for those wires underground. I was digging and my internet wire was like right under there. I nicked it and I had to, you know, splice it. And that's something that you can easily do if you just have you know, internet, just like I do. This is the cable internet. You can go to the store and get the splicers to splice it back together. You don't have to call the company or anything if you necessarily, if you hit it, but um, definitely be wary of that. Of course, you can always call the dig line um, and they will come out and let you know what's underneath your property. So next, talking about that soil preparation, like I said, um, after this, the top layer of turf is removed, you're definitely going to want to till that soil up. So just go ahead and if you don't have a formal tiller, um, you can just use a shovel and you know dig it up and just till up the top, you know, um, 6 to 12 inches of soil or whatever. Break it all up, fluff it up. You want to remove any types of, you know, your things that's in your garden, rocks. Um, extra little pieces of grass or roots or whatever that you see in there. Um, and then after you've tilled it the first time, then you can go ahead and put compost on top. Like I said, I, I usually like to, you know, unless I see uh, some horrible problem with the soil or anything like that, um, I usually like to put about maybe like one to two inches on top of the soil of the compost and then I, I till that in. Next, after that compost has been tilled in, you're ready to go ahead and put your plants in. So lay out the plants, make sure that they're all exactly where you want them to be, make any last minute changes that you see. Um, then of course, you're just gonna dig your holes, put in the plants, make sure you dig your holes big. And that um, you, especially if you are getting your plants from a nursery and they're super root bound, you wanna make sure that you're just with your hand breaking up those roots to facilitate them going into the soil. And after all your plants are in the ground, you want to make sure to water them in really, really, really well, even before you add that next layer of mulch on top. So next, you're going to add that layer of mulch. You want your mulch layer to be about two to three inches thick. And of course, the thicker you have it, um, you're going to be deterring more weeds. You're going to be keeping more soil moisture in there. Of course, you don't want it too thick and you don't want it um, up around the bases completely right up, up against the bases of the plants because that can create um, fungal issues and rot issues. So you want to make sure that you're letting the plant breathe, um, but that there's plenty of mulch on the bare soil area to keep it protected. And after you've added that mulch on top, spread it out, made it look nice and everything, you want to go ahead and um, be sure to water in again. So in terms of maintaining your pollinator garden, it really doesn't take a lot of maintenance. Of course, at first, you're going to make sure to keep it wet, right? For the first two weeks, you want to make sure to water it in really good and keep it moist, make sure that those plants are thriving and staying alive for their transition period. Over the next eight weeks or so, you want to make sure that you water at least maybe two to two times a week. You want to monitor that soil. Um, you do want to let it, you know, dry out a little bit in between, um, but you don't want to keep it too dry for too long because your plants are still pretty new. And then um, at this beginning phase, you really want to see what type of plants you have and figure out for your future maintenance exactly how much you, you need to water those plants. In terms of maintaining the actual plants, around January or February is when you generally cut perennials to the ground. So all of the above ground vegetation, for the most part, and most of these native plants will die off 
the roots will still be alive and you can go through in January or February after, um, you know, the really cold part of the winter and go ahead and cut off all of that dead vegetation on top. You can also prune your woody plants um, and it's a good time also to apply more mulch because you don't have a lot of plants uh, covering your bare ground at that point. It is best to for pollinators to wait as long as you possibly can. Um, and it's really a, an aesthetic decision. Um, if you really can't handle having that dead vegetation stick around, you can definitely cut it down if you'd like. But the longer that you keep it around, the more support for pollinators are going to be there. And if you're removing that vegetation during the winter, that dead vegetation, um, there's always a possibility that you are removing some baby pollinators that have overwintered in that dead vegetation. So there's always the option too, if you want to remove it off of the actual plants to get that cleaner look, but then maybe take some of that dead vegetation and um, stack it, you know, in the back of the pollinator garden or something like that to still maintain that housing. If you'd like, you can cut off dead blooms during the growing season. Um, it's called deadheading plants or whatever. Of course, that just encourages more blooming, but it's absolutely not necessary at all if that's not something that you want to do. Um, a lot of people like the look of a lot of bare space and mulch in between plants, but just a reminder, the less space that you have in between plants, um, that means less maintenance that you have to do and less weeding. Most of these plants will grow pretty big pretty quickly. And if you space them correctly, they will um, completely merge into kind of one another and you won't have any sunlight really getting to the mulch and, and after they're full grown, you won't really have to do a whole lot of weeding at all. And then you wanna make sure that you're not applying any type of pesticides or herbicides or anything like that. Of course, this is a pollinator garden, so we do not wanna kill any of the insects or um, otherwise pollinators that we're trying to attract. All right, so just a little bit about what to expect for your plants. These plants are happy to thrive in, in our climate and our conditions. So if you just give them just a little bit more water, just a little bit more care, um, they generally will, will pretty much explode. Um, most of our native plants do not like to have wet feet. So if you continuously keep them wet, they will rot and die. But um, if you give them a little bit of supplemental irrigation, uh, a lot of times they'll just produce tons of flowers and continue to produce flowers, continue to produce vegetation. Um, one thing to be weary about is that if you do have a particularly wet spring or you water a whole lot during the first portion of the year, a lot of these plants can grow um, a lot of vegetation, which then they have trouble supporting once it gets really hot outside. So you do wanna be weary of that. Um, and make sure that you're not wiring too much at the beginning of the year to overextend themselves. But for the most part, in terms of these natives, if you want to water them, they will be beautiful. If you don't want to water them, they will be alive. Um, so most of them will not die over our even our hot summers. Um, if you choose to only just use supplemental irrigation during the really hot times and dry times of the summer, that's also great. These plants will look absolutely beautiful and absolutely wonderful with absolutely no um, supplemental irrigation whatsoever because again they are native to this area and completely happy to live without any intervention from humans. In terms of what to expect for the pollinators, um, you really can expect to attract some amazing things pretty quickly. I have created multiple pollinator gardens over the years, and it is really amazing how every single time you will go, and particularly if it's just a turf area, you will essentially see no pollinators beforehand. And you might think like, well, are the pollinators even here? Like, is there even anything to come if I do plant these flowers? And then you plant the pollinator uh, garden and you realize all of the things that come out of the woodwork um, to come to visit your garden. So. I'm always amazed at all the different things that I have never seen before um, in, you know, even in urban areas, in suburban, you know, um, residential areas. There are tons of super unique and interesting pollinators that will show up if you just plant the right plants and provide the right habitat for them. Another interesting thing is, is that you can expect to attract wildlife that aren't necessarily pollinators. So here in this picture, the two, um, insects that you see on the right hand that the top right hand is a robber fly and then the bottom right hand is a, a dragonfly 
And both of those things, you know, neither of them are pollinators. They are actually predators to the pollinators, right? And so um, once you attract these pollinators, of course, you'll attract all the things that come with it. So you'll get to see some other interesting things. And, um, and depending on how your pollinator garden is, there's a possibility that it can attract some other things. I know that a lot of times people have things like um, ducks nesting, you know, in their grasses or things like that. So there's lots of other wildlife that are super happy to come and um, utilize the wildlife habitat that you've created. Okay, so that is the end of the presentation. Thank you so much for joining me to hear about establishing a pollinator garden. Here's some resources that you can use. If you go to saveterrantwater.com slash pollinator, again, I've listed tons of just resources about native plants and native pollinators and how you can um, build your plant palette, figure out whether plants are native or not, get information about how to create your pollinator garden or just a, a general native plant garden. Um, you can also go to saveterrantwater.com slash ask if you have any questions just about, um, about the pollinator gardens, about low uh, low water use landscaping, about uh, water conservation in general. Go to saveterrantwater.com slash ask and we will answer your question. Um, you can also go to saveterrantwater.com save slash getting dash visual. That's where we've listed all of these videos. So you'll see this video on there along with all of our other videos that we have about low water use landscaping and um, DIY irrigation fixes and things like that. You can also go to saveterrantwater.com slash events, and that's where our event calendar is, where you can see our list of future events that are coming up. Uh, my name is Heather Bass, and I am a conservation specialist um, for the conservation Water Conservation Department at TRWD. And so if you want to contact me or if you have any questions, again, for our conservation department, you can email conservation at trwd.com, and we will talk with you about whatever you want. So thank you so much for joining me for this presentation, and I hope that you create a wonderful pollinator garden.